So you want to buy an Apple II and you have no idea where to start. Well, I'm here to help. Back in the late 70s up through at least the mid 80s, four computers made up about 80% of the US home market. The TRS-80, the Commodore 64, the Atari 8-bit line, and the Apple II. I've already done a video on the Apple II in general and another on fixing my broken Apple IIc the actual computer I've had since 1985. But today I want to do kind of a buyer's guide for those of you thinking about diving into the world of the Apple II. I'm learning to use an Apple for text editing, which is uh, useful. Some of my texts could use some editing. You can edit right here on the screen. You can add words like this, or you can remove words like that, or you can move whole paragraphs around to anywhere you want them. It's amazing. Maybe you grew up in the 80s and you're living out your nostalgia. Or maybe you just bought an iPhone and want to experience the roots of that device. Either way, I'm up for any new excuse to talk about my favorite classic computer. The Apple II is not just one computer. It's a full computer line, just like the Mac. And it's a line that was on the market for 16 years, with a bunch of different models to choose from. Which is the best for a beginner? And what should you look out for? Well, let's check it out. The original Apple II was released in 1977, quickly followed up by the II Plus, then the IIe, the IIc, the IIe Enhanced, and yes, that stands for Two Enhanced Enhanced, then the IIgs, the Platinum IIe, and the IIc Plus. Every model is a bit different, some vastly different, and all have reasons why someone might want one. But I want to focus most on the three models that I have behind me, and I'll explain why as we go along. The models I have here are the 2GS, the Platinum 2E, and the 2C. You'll probably notice right off the bat that each of these machines is in some stage of yellowing, and that's going to be true of pretty much any Apple II you find that isn't new old stock. Apple IIs are highly prone to turning hues ranging from banana yellow to New York City cab. They can be brought back with a retrobriting process, and any non-yellowed models you find will probably have already had that done. I'm showing these models as they are to give you an idea of what an Apple II is probably going to look like when you buy one. Let's look at each of these machines individually, starting with the Platinum IIe. This is the machine I'd recommend if you're just interested in running the most 8-bit software, meaning traditional Apple II software that was produced for the entire run of the line. The Platinum IIe was the last Apple II in its original form factor and with its original, well, slightly revised CPU and architecture. But it came stock with more RAM than earlier models and an 80 column card. So it can run basically any of the 8-bit Apple II software without mods or upgrades. And that's the vast majority of all Apple II software, including later software that had the heftiest system requirements. Remember, these were the days when 80 columns was not even standard. The easiest way to distinguish a Platinum IIe from any other IIe is its keyboard. It's the only Apple II in this original style case to have a number pad, though it also did lose the distinctive metal badge present on earlier Apple IIs. Be aware that the IIe and earlier machines did not come stock with a lot of the stuff you really need to make them work. So if you buy one, make sure it's got at least a serial card and disk controller installed, and also that the owner hasn't removed the RAM upgrade slash 80 column card to sell separately. You know sellers can be shady. If you don't even want to worry about that stuff, you can look for a 2C instead. The 2C is the compact version of the Apple II, and it's the first computer Steve Jobs had a hand in designing, though the actual case is the work of famed designer Hartmut Esslinger. It does away with the previous two models' slots completely, in favor of putting all the most common upgrades and additions directly on the motherboard. So it's fully stocked from the get-go, but it's also hard to customize later if you decide you want to. Things like advanced graphics cards are difficult, if not impossible, to add to a 2C. 
Some early 2Cs do have a small space under the keyboard that can be used for certain custom designed cards. There's one big caveat with the 2C, and that's that you've got to jump through some serious hoops to use any sort of floppy emulator with it, which is something you're probably going to want to help you get software onto your machine. The alternative is limiting yourself to physically collecting only software you can find on five and a quarter inch disc, or bootstrapping with your PC every time you want to run something. The reason for this limitation is that most 2Cs, except for the first and least common ROM version, are hardwired to only boot from the internal floppy. You will boot from the device Steve Jobs wants you to boot from, and you will like it. 2Es and 2GSs do not have this limitation. Now there is also the 2C Plus, which is not only the fastest 8-bit Apple II ever made, clocking in at a whopping 4 MHz, but it can at least help a bit with the floppy emulator problem. Later Apple IIs like the 2GS and 2C Plus used a drive connector called a smart port to which you could daisy chain two 5 and a quarter and two 3 and a half inch drives. But you can only boot from drive one of each type. Since the 2C Plus has a built in 3 and a half inch drive, that's 3 and a half inch drive one. So you can't boot from a floppy emulator in 3 and a half inch mode, but you can in 5 and a quarter inch mode which in most cases is a better deal because very little 8-bit Apple II software was released on 3.5-inch disk. 2C Pluses are harder to find and more expensive than 2Cs, and they also pretty much require you to buy either a floppy emulator, a separate 5.25-inch drive, or both to really get much use out of one, but they're worth considering. That brings me to the last model here. For most Apple II buyers, I'd say just get a 2GS and be done with it. To me, it's a no-brainer. Imagine a brain whose left side is as brilliant as its right. A brain as artistic as it is logical, that can calculate and create. Such a brain exists in the remarkable new Apple II GS. Brilliant graphics, brilliant color, brilliant sound. To help you use both sides of the most personal computer of all, your mind. Ten years into the series run, the 2GS was the first all-new Apple II architecture since the original. It was intended to be a new beginning for the line and its entry into the 16-bit world. It has a new CPU that runs its own more advanced 2GS-specific programs, and even a graphical interface if you want it, but it also has what amounts to a separate 2E subsystem for backward compatibility. It has all the slots of the 2E, but it also has everything you need to get started built in. It runs the most software of any Apple II, it's the most expandable, it's backward compatible with everything the 2E is, and it's surprisingly not the most expensive despite being the most powerful, feature-packed Apple II there is. Now you might see different ROM revisions out there, and you might also be tempted to buy one of those so-called limited edition signed WAS models. Avoid that, because these are usually ROM double zero models and they can be a bit buggy. A few have been upgraded to ROM 01, and these are probably okay. But you really do want to stick with a ROM 01 or a ROM 3. Threes are somewhat rarer and maybe a little more expensive because they're slightly faster than earlier ROM revisions. One caveat with the 2GS is that you will need to replace the CMOS battery. This is one of those don't think about it, just do it things. It's not optional. Even if it's been replaced once, you don't know how long ago, and the penalty for a bad CMOS battery is electrolyte all over your motherboard, shorting it out. In other words, a dead computer. ROM 3s make this really easy because the battery is socketed, but it's only two solder points to worry about even on a ROM 01. The only real downside of the 2GS is that it is so different from earlier Apple IIs. I've seen people make the case that it's just not the same experience. And it can be more like using an early Mac, especially if you run GSOS, the system's own graphical operating system. It is true that it doesn't have quite as retro of a feeling to it with its clicky detached keyboard and its more advanced graphics and sound. But if you're running 8-bit software, I would argue that you quickly forget about the form factor of the computer itself, and it feels just like any other Apple II. Remember too that lots of us who had 8-bit Apple IIs back in the day lusted after the 2GS and just couldn't afford one. Choosing a lower spec Apple II today for a more authentic experience is kind of like choosing a 1979 Chevette over a Corvette Stingray. 
It's not really any more authentic or any more retro. It's just not as good. Again, other models beyond these do have their charms, but they're probably not the best choice for those owning just one Apple II, because they're generally more limited in what they can do, or at least need upgrades that you might have to do right off the bat. So what is the most expensive Apple II? The original. These have now gone beyond the realm of reasonable, given their need for upgrades to run most Apple II software. They usually came with just 4K of RAM, for example, and didn't have the auxiliary slot of the 2E to easily add more beyond 48K. Still, it's not uncommon for original 2 machines to command more than $1,000 on eBay. Clearly, these are just going to collectors who want to keep them sitting on a shelf, because there are much more usable 2 models for a lot less money. My guess is that some of these guys who can't afford an Apple I are settling instead for an early Apple II. Now keep in mind, like any computer, you're going to need a way to run software. Very early Apple IIs used cassette tapes, but this was extremely short-lived. Once the Disk 2 drive was released in 1978, it quickly took over and became the de facto storage standard. Later drives, like the ones I have, are compatible with the Disk 2. This backward compatibility was one of the two line's strengths. Unlike some classic machines, there's no cartridge interface for the Apple II, so pretty much everything's on disk. Five and a quarter inch disks were standard up until very late in the II's lifespan, when Apple attempted to switch over to three and a half inch. You don't really need to worry much about this if you pick up a floppy emulator of some kind, which I really recommend unless you get a giant box of disks with your computer and they all happen to work. Now the Apple II is lucky enough to have two viable floppy emulators, the Floppy Emu, which is what I currently have, and the CFFA3000, which I'm on the waiting list for. Both of these will emulate 5 and a quarter inch, 3 and a half inch, and hard drives, allowing you to easily run disk images that you've stored on your modern computer and transfer over on an SD card. The CFFA3000 is an internal card, so it'll only work on Apple II models with internal slots. The Floppy Emu is an external device that plugs into your floppy connector or smart port. The CFFA is faster from the benchmarks I've seen, just due to it using the internal bus but it's also more expensive and not always available. The next run is supposedly the last, so if you want one, get on that waiting list fast. And don't forget about the monitor. If you're buying a 2GS, do yourself a favor and just get a complete set with the matching RGB monitor. The 2GS can use certain other monitors with various adapters, but that's probably not something you'll want to deal with right away. The 2GS monitor is a good one. It looks cool on top of the system, and it's hard to find separately. Other Apple IIs have a sort of composite output that works on most monitors and TVs with a composite input, including modern displays, although sometimes you'll only get a black and white picture. Apple II Color is more or less a composite artifact harnessed for the purposes of good, which is why even when it does work, you get strange color bleeding with even the best monitors. Some displays, though, just won't interpret Apple II Color at all. So, assuming you do want the full-on retro experience, your best bet in a color monitor is to get one either as part of a set with the computer, so you know it works, or at least one specifically advertised as meant to work with the Apple II. Or just go completely lo-fi. The Apple II is at heart a monochrome machine, and plenty of people, myself included, used a monochrome monitor with it on purpose. It was well known at the time that both text and graphics were much sharper in monochrome, because there was no ghosting or phantom color. Now, official Apple monitors were green, but many of us at the time considered the amber glow of the Amdeck Video Monitor 300A a luxurious and upscale choice that was less eye-straining. You may notice that Apple II users like to stack stuff precariously on top of their machines. This is probably both Steve's fault. Plenty of pictures exist of them doing this. But the original Disk 2 drives and monitors weren't really made for it, and both aren't very stable and also look kind of stupid when stacked, so I'd really advise against it. Stack your drives on the side at the very least. The later Duo Disk and Apple Monitor 2 were designed for stacking, so if you have these, then you can stack with my blessing. Lastly, if you're going to be playing games, you're probably going to need a joystick. 
Apple II joysticks were among the first analog joysticks out there. Yes, before the Atari 5200 or even the Vectrex. Early Apple II joysticks were generally a simple shaft with two buttons on the base. Later models took on more of a bat shape with one button on top, while very late sticks had more of a game console look and feel. I personally prefer the middle period sticks like the CH Mach 3 or this Suncom stick that I have here. You do have to use an Apple II specific joystick. You can't use one made for another computer or game console, unless it's switchable with a Y adapter like this one. There were a number of combo Apple slash PC sticks like this. So that's about all you need to know to get started with the Apple II. I do answer questions, so if there's anything I didn't cover here, feel free to ask in a comment below. Happy hunting for your new machine. Bye-bye.